When I say American Concorde, you think of the Boeing 2707. But another design almost won the government contract, the Lockheed L2000. It was cheaper and easier to build, and had it been put into production, it's possible it would have made it to the market and still be flying today. Let's explore what the world of the L2000 would have been like. Thanks so much for joining this video today. If you've seen a few of my videos already, then it's time to subscribe. Only 8% of my viewers actually subscribe, so let's get that over 10% and that would be grand. Let's go. In 1961, in retaliation to the Concorde and the Soviet endeavor to build a supersonic transport, President Kennedy authorized a contest to build an American equivalent. The prize would be 75% subsidizing the cost of research and production of the aircraft, but there would be an important condition attached. Whatever design proposed would be significantly more technologically advanced over the Concorde, have to carry at least 250 passengers, double that of the Concorde, and fly faster and further than the European counterpart. Essentially, the US wanted a Concorde killer that would have dominated the 500 SST market and cemented the American dominance in airspace for decades to come. North American Aviation, Boeing and Lockheed answered the call, with only the latter two making it through to the final round. While the Boeing 2707 has been well covered by many on this platform, including myself where you can see right here, the Lockheed L2000 has fallen into history as a major could have been. Let's explore the design. Lockheed had been working on an SST design since 1958, before the contest, and with a creation that could fly at cruise speeds of around 2,000 miles per hour, or 3,200 kilometers per hour, with takeoff and landing speeds just like a normal plane to avoid the noise landing problem. This plane design originally had straight wings like the F-104 Starfighter, but during wind tunnel tests, it ended up causing issues with drag and the plane's center of pressure when going supersonic. The next stage was to change the aircraft's design into a delta shape, but then this came at a crunch when it came to the aircraft's landing and take off. Lockheed considered a swing wing like the Boeing 2707 design, but they believed that the joint mechanism would be too heavy, which we now know that Boeing ultimately abandoned it for the same reason. The plane would also need canards for the front to control the plane as it flew subsonically. By 1963 and five years of research, Lockheed had shifted the leading edge of the wing forward, removing the canards and moving the engines from within the plane to under the wing, resembling the final design that would be pitched to the contest. This final design was called the L2000-1 and was 223 feet or 70 meters long and had a narrow body fuselage of only 132 inches wide or 335 centimeters. This would mean that the passengers would have to sit in a 2-3 configuration in economy or a 2-2 in first class for a total of 170 passengers or up to 200 if all economy. To help reduce the production time and cost, Lockheed looked to its other projects for engines, and it had the perfect one. The Pratt & Whitney J58, famously used on the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, could be slung under the wing and provide the supersonic thrusts that the plane design required. Being a turbofan design as opposed to a turbojet, it would require no afterburner to get into the sky and would be significantly quieter. Speaking of noise, the plane would also try to tackle the problem of sonic booms. The L2000-1 would break the barrier at 42,000 feet, 12,800 meters altitude, rather than 30,000 feet or 9,100 meters, making a less noticeable sonic boom noise on the ground. The plane would then climb up to a shockingly high cruising altitude of 76.5 thousand feet or 23.3 thousand meters at Mach 3.0 for the journey. 
This would make it perfect for a domestic route of New York to Miami over the ocean or competing against the Concorde to Europe. By 1964, there were two major changes. The US government changed the requirements to improve performance and engine manufacturers Pratt & Whitney and General Electric, who were doing their own contest for the engine at the same time for an SST, had designed more powerful supersonic engines. As Lockheed didn't know who would actually win the contest for the engine, the L-2000-2, as it was called, would need engine pods that could fit either design. The silver lining was that these new powerful engines allowed supersonic penetration to occur as late as 45,000 feet, 13.7 meters above sea level for the L-2000, meaning an even quieter boom. Lockheed was ready to pitch the aircraft against rival Boeing. Submitting a new supersonic transport concept is risky, and Lockheed decided to bring two to the meeting. The first was the L-2000-7A. It was longer than the initial designs and can carry up to 230 passengers. Lockheed also had a bigger version called the L-2000-7B that could be used domestically over land and could carry up to 273 domestic passengers and plenty of cargo at nearly 300 feet long. With the hard work done, Lockheed sat back and crossed their fingers. Unfortunately, it seems that the selection committee had other ideas, and on December 31st, 1966, chose the Boeing 2707 moving forward. And it seems that compared to the Boeing 2707, the Lockheed design was deemed too simple and too close to the Concorde, with high fuel burning and loud on takeoff and landing. The Boeing 2707 was such an imaginary leap forward with technology that the Lockheed plane was deemed too safe. But here's the thing. The Lockheed design with all its flaws were much simpler and cheaper and easier to build. Unlike the Boeing 2707, which used titanium throughout, the L-2000 used a much easier to produce and cheaper stainless steel and restricted titanium use to only specific areas where it offered a clear advantage over stainless steel. As we know now, Boeing would actually abandon many of the advanced features that had made them a winner and even go back to what worked, the Lockheed Delta Wing design. If Lockheed had won the contest instead of Boeing, perhaps they would have been able to make a series of prototypes, or even better, a production model for an airline like Delta by the time Congress was considering pulling funding in 1971. And perhaps I could even say that with an aircraft flying and orders being delivered, those mines in Washington would have not been so eager to close the program and we would have seen funding well to the oil crisis of 1973, enough to make a substantial impact on the world of aviation. Thanks so much for watching this video today. It would not be impossible without my Patreons and those who have supported me for the last year. I can't wait to show you the many more designs that I have cooked up, and by the time you're watching this, I should have about six more never-built crazy concepts well on the way to meet you. So if you haven't already, it's time to subscribe and check out more in the world of never-built.